Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 22nd, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, Mike Lozano, home brewer and mead maker from Aurora, Colorado, joins us to go over the basics of making mead. We go from the ground up and lay a foundation for making great honey-based beverages. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter when it's working. My uh, username is basicbrewing, all one word. I want to keep my opening comments fairly brief because uh, Mike and I talked for quite a while about uh, meads. There was a lot of ground to cover. However, uh, I want to remind you that we're taking the month of June off in posting our regular weekly audio podcast. Steve and I hope to see you in Cincinnati in June at the National Homebrewers Conference. It should be a hoot. Uh, We're going to try to get together some live video updates while we're out there. And speaking of which, Steve and I are planning to get together this upcoming Monday, May 26th, to uh, record the Green Brewing Podcast, finally, featuring letters from you guys. I think we're also going to try to record a video podcast that same night. The reason I'm mentioning it here is that we're planning to do a live video stream while we're recording those. And uh, you can check out ustream.tv slash basic brewing. That's U-S-T-R-E-A-M dot TV slash basic brewing. Check that out Monday night at around 8 o'clock p.m., of course, if it's Monday night, central time. And uh, I hope that uh, if everything works out right, we'll be live there. And you can see us record those podcasts. We're still playing with the technology, but uh, I have high hopes that we'll be able to get our act together. And uh, that's a Ustream, U-S-T-R-E-A-M dot TV slash Basic Brewing at uh, 8 p.m. Central Time here in the United States, Monday night. Be there. Aloha. The guys at, uh, <laughs> the guys at Craft Beer Radio went to a Saver. That's the craft beer event hosted by the Brewers Association in Washington, D.C. a few days ago. And if you go to craftbeerradio.com or if you subscribe to their feed, uh, you can download recordings of the uh, presentations that were made at Saver. And uh, I understand there are more interviews uh, coming. It's good stuff. And I enjoyed listening to it while I was bottling up a brew this week. And I look forward to hearing more from that. Also, NPR's Talk of the Nation Science Friday did a show from Milwaukee this past week, and a big part of the program was about beer. Makes sense. Uh, Lynn Kruger, who you've heard on this program in the past, she's president of the Siebel Institute. She was on that show, along with other uh, brewers and brewing experts. It's a good listen, if for nothing else, but to be reminded about um, how little most of the world knows about how beer is brewed. Um, amazing. Some of the questions that Ira Flato, even the host, and s- some of the audience members asked were kind of surprising. It's it's clear that we've we've got a lot of work to do as uh, beer evangelists, and that's uh, that's from NPR's uh, Talk of the Nation Science Friday from last week. Well, let's take a quick look into the mailbag. Randy from Minneapolis, Minnesota, writes: You mentioned growing several varieties of hops. Is cross fertilization an issue? If it isn't an issue with species grown from rhizomes, please excuse my botanical ignorance. Not a problem, Randy. Um, I'll take a stab at answering this, and I hope I get it right. Um, as I understand it, since your hops are grown from rhizomes or, or you know, essentially cuttings from other existing hop plants, your hops are clones of their donor plants. They are genetically identical. Since they're not grown from seeds... You're getting the same genetics from that original plant. So the hop cones that come from that plant will be the same. That's how they can guarantee you that if they send you a cascade rhizome, it's going to be, it's going to produce cascade hops. Uh, the only reason that you have to worry about cross-fertilization is if you're planting the seeds that you get from your hop cones and wanting to get new plants that way. And since hop cones only come from female plants anyway, you essentially just got a bunch of girls in your in your hop yard there. Um, but let's say you have a, a rogue male holler tower plant in the neighborhood, and its pollen fertilizes the flowers on your female cascade plant. 
Well, the hop cones that come out will still be Cascade. They'll still taste like Cascade and bitter like Cascade and smell like Cascade. And unless you're wanting to try to harvest the seeds that come from those cones, you don't have to worry about hybridization or cross-fertilization. I hope that's right. think that's right. hope it makes sense. Uh, I wrote on Twitter that I was getting some yellow bottom leaves on my holler tower plant. Now, my wife thinks that it's from overwatering, but Norm from Linwood, Washington writes, this may be the first sign of powdery mildew. The mold spores are in the soil and will wash up on the lower leaves when you water it or when it rains. Here's what you should do. Number one, re- remove the affected leaves. Number two, you'll use mulch around your hops. This will do two things, help reduce the amount of water used and keep more mold spores from flashing, uh, sp- uh, hello, splashing on the hops. I do that. I do use mulch. And number three, treat your hops for powdery mildew now. Do not wait too long. If you need to get out, uh, you need to get out in front of any powdery mildew before any flowers form or your crop will be toast. Well, that's uh, scary, especially with all the all caps and exclamation marks. So you got my attention. (laughs) I appreciate that, Norm, and I'm I'm looking into how to treat uh, powdery mildew. But I, I hope my wife is right, and that I'm watering too much. But uh, just in case, I'm going to follow your advice. Better safe than sorry, I would think. Um, okay. Well, like I said, we have a lot of ground to cover with Mike Lozano. You may remember that we visited with Mike at his home and, and tasted his meads when we were at the Great American Beer Festival a couple of years ago. And I asked Mike to come back on the show to take us from the ground up on making a good mead. Well, Mike Lozano, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks, James. It's an honor and a privilege, always. Now, we've, we've spent a bit of time talking about mead on the show, both the audio and video podcast through the years. But uh, we were talking via email, and I guess basically we have not done a, a back-to-the-basics mead episode. You know, we haven't just gone from the ground up for people who have never made a mead, I don't think to go through just sort of kind of a regimen of the basics of what makes a, a good mead. And and you, thankfully, have volunteered to, to help us walk through that, and I appreciate that. That is my pleasure. It's something that I take a lot of pleasure in. I find that uh, when I'm down at the homebrew store, uh, someone mentions mead, and my ears always perk up, and I always spend about half an hour there longer than I intended to. <laughs> Well, maybe we can do half an hour tonight, and you can just refer people to this episode, and that way you can be on your way to brew. <laughs> Sounds like a perfect plan to me. <laughs> now, uh, when you make mead, it's not really brewing, is it? It is and it isn't. Um, it's not brewing in the sense that you think of as in beer. What it really is is that you're fermenting sugar. Um, there's not a lot – there's no – well, if you do it the way that I do it, there's really no boiling. There's no hops involved for boiling to get the uh, hop bitterness and those kind of things. Although there are, I'm sure, experiments afoot in that uh, in that realm. But uh, a traditional mead, and by traditional mead we mean just basically water, honey, and yeast with some additional nutrient uh, to, to get the fermentation going. There are no hops. It's just, as I said, honey, water, and yeast at a very basic level. So it is brewing, but it's really not brewing as you think of as, as a beer. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not a wine exactly, and it's not a beer. So it's somewhere in between the two realms. So it, it kind of lends, you know, home brewers tend to make a meat every now and then. I think it lends itself to a crossover. It does. Uh, there's There are some people online, if you read some of the forums and whatnot, what people say on, online, some people got, can get confused. They'll say that meat is supposed to taste like beer, and some people say, no, meat is supposed to taste like wine. And uh, I kind of put up my hands and go, wait a minute, meat is its own thing. It's supposed to taste like meat. So I try to point them at a, either a good commercial meat, if they're online, if they're close to me, I actually bring one of my own and say, here, taste this. And tell me if you think it tastes like a wine or a beer. And they say, wow, I didn't realize it tasted like this. So it's uh, I don't like to think of it as in between so much. I like to think of it as its own entity altogether. Ah, well, there you go. So let's go, let's jump in. The Let's talk about equipment. Okay. If, you, if you are a home brewer and you're making beer at home, 
you've got most of the stuff that you need to make mead, right? Yeah, absolutely, you do. Uh, at a basic level, you'll need a carboy. You'll need some clean water, and uh, you can filter your own or buy, uh, you know, commercial water from the store. You know, just regular spring water. Um, you will need honey. Depending on how big of a batch you're making and how sweet or how alcoholic you want to make it will determine how much honey you need. You'll need uh, yeast. Uh, you'll need some other specialized ingredients that we'll go into later. Uh, but all these standard home brewing stuff that you would think of, once you get to fermentation, you'll still need. You'll need uh, funnel. You'll need uh, racking canes. You'll need a secondary fermenter. Uh, you'll want some way of watching the temperature, uh, some way of stirring things in. So if if you're a if you are a beer brewer, you have probably everything you need to brew mead. Now, what are some things that are kind of beyond the basics with equipment that you probably want to have but don't necessarily have to have? So some of the implements that you want to have, uh, especially when you start getting into you know fine tuning your fermentation management. And everything about going into mead fermentation is about managing that fermentation uh, really come from the wine world. And this is where they, people get kind of confused. Oh, it's like a wine. Well, yes, in fermentation, it's similar to wine, but there are some distinct differences. So um, the first thing that I always recommend people have is a pH meter. Now, the pH strips are good to a point, but when you start going into actively uh, managing your mead fermentation, you really want to have a meter to be able to get accurate readings. Uh, you'll see as we talk about process that the pH of a mead must can change drastically within the first 24 hours of yeast pitch. And you need to be able to determine, oh, at this point I need to add something to, to adjust back up uh, and make it less acidic. And you really can't do that well with the mead strips. They're just too inaccurate. So uh, a pH meter from your local homebrew store is great. Be sure that you get the adjustment kit uh, that comes with uh, these pH liquids that you use to adjust your pH meter to, to tune it, as you will. And uh, I always recommend that you do that, that you adjust your meter with those chemicals before every use. And you also uh, recommend uh, a refractometer. In addition to a hydrometer, right? Correct. Now, the refractometer is great, especially when you're doing small batches. Um, I'm a small batch brewer. I love doing small batches, especially when I'm doing experimental batches. We've talked about some of my experimental batches on previous shows. When you're doing a managed fermentation, you have to take regular um, gravity readings, regular Brix readings. And if you're taking out a sample and you're trying to fill up a test tube and putting a hydrometer in, uh, and then you throw that out every time, pretty soon your one-gallon batch turns into a one-quart batch. <laughs> so if you if you could use a refract refractometer, you can only you only have to take a very small sample and you can get a reading. There are calculations online that can help you adjust that brick reading for a. Uh, during fermentation reading, because as you know, once alcohol gets in, it cha it it uh, alters the reading that you get from the refractometer. But there are calculations online that you can use to adjust for that to get an accurate reading. So when you're doing small batches, you're taking regular readings so that you know when to add your nutrients in. It makes it a lot more efficient, so where you're not wasting a lot of must. And uh, I've got an a, an oxygen system with an aquarium stone or a or a um, an aeration stone. Uh, in, but, you know, in brewing beer, most moder moderate gravity beers, that's not a necessity. But uh, are you saying that uh, to do meads properly because they are so high gravity that uh, an oxygen system and an uh, aeration stone, you think they're essential? It's a perk for sure. Um, I'm lazy, as uh, I think I've said a couple of times <laughs> in the show. And uh, when you're trying to aerate a you know, five-gallon batch of mead to the proper oxygen levels uh, without an aeration stone, it can get uh, very tiring very quickly. And in some of my brews, when I'm doing two batches a day, especially when I do my my wine kit split patch uh, piments, it, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, so an oxygen stone uh, allows you to add that oxygen in very quickly. 
you know, a minute at uh, yeast pitch, maybe a minute, the, you know, the next morning or 30 seconds the next morning, you don't have to take it down and shake the heck out of it anymore. You just put the oxygen stone in and, and get the pure R2. It really helps out in the high gravity musts, and most of my musts are over 1.100. Mm. So they they uh they start out very very high gravity. Now what's a gas whip? <laughs> a, ga- a gas whip is another great invention that comes from the wine world. It's it's um, not an implement that you feel like you've been hit with after you fill up your tank, but it's oh no, <laughs> this is a great little gadget that you put on the end of a drill. And you put this gadget down into the uh, carboy, and you turn on the drill, and the, these paddles swing out. Uh, There's one, the model that I have, and it whips the must. The idea with this for most wines is to whip out all of the CO2 gas. It helps in clearing, and it makes it, it makes sure that the wine is still when you bottle it. Um, I use this gadget for many, many things, not the least of which is adding in ingredients, um, cold mixing. Uh, with the honey, very useful for that, um, and of course, doing the the gas whipping it's, uh, whipping itself when the time comes uh, makes it, it it saves labor. It, boy, does it save labor! Mm-hmm. Um, it's probably probably one of the best uh, in, investments I've made in, in mead making in a, in a while. It's a great little uh, gadget to have. That's uh, kind of fun too. Oh, absolutely! There's nothing more like. <laughs> excuse me, I have to work on my mead, and you close the door, and all they hear they hear this <laughs> coming from behind the door. It's great stuff. <laughs> Get your aggressions out on the must. And oh, as, oh absolutely. <laughs> now, the last piece of equipment that I that I would strongly recommend is going to be a gram scale. You need a gram scale that can read at least tenth of grams, uh, uh, one hundredth of a gram, if you can get it. Um, when uh, especially doing small batches, we're adding in these nutrients. These nutrients will be weighed out in grams, and then sometimes fractions of a gram. And uh, without that gram meter, you're going to be guessing. Hmm. And uh, I don't like to guess, especially when you're doing very very small additions to very very small batches. So a gram scale is key. Now let's talk about the ingredients. That now, would any honey do? Just any any honey that tastes good? You can use any honey that you want. It doesn't guarantee that the meat is going to taste good. Uh, this is where experimentation and uh, experience and finding an experienced meat maker comes in handy. Every honey has its own characteristics, and each of those characteristics is going to come out in the meat, especially if you're doing a traditional meat. If you like the taste of the honey, chances are it's going to make a fine meat. There are some honeys that are very well known to make great meats, uh, orange blossom being the first one that comes to my mind. Uh, so if you just want to start out, you're thinking about what honey you want to make for your first mead, orange blossom is a great choice. But uh, once you get into it, I say experiment. I've got a batch going right now with um, a Cefail, uh dry beer yeast. It's American ale, their American ale type yeast, with carrot honey. Hmm. So it's very twangy when you taste it, and it's like, huh. This would make an interesting meat, I think, just to see. So just to see what it tasted like, I made up a batch. So it's sitting in there fermenting right now. It's at the uh, very, very end of the fermentation phase, and it uh, should be starting to clear here within the next couple of days or so. But uh, you know, any any honey can be used. Doesn't guarantee it's going to make a great meat, though. Have you had any failures? What's uh, what's your least favorite uh, honey to make mead with? There are certain types of buckwheat honey that just shouldn't see the other side of a mead fermentation, really. <laughs> um, that's my personal opinion. Some people seem to think it's interesting. I can't stand it. But uh, there are some others that, I, that I'm that i shying away from. I think mint honey I've stayed away from, and eucalyptus honey I'm eh, hmm. not, so, not so hot on. Uh, one of these days I'll try it, but uh, just not too uh, really motivated to try those honeys. But uh, definitely I've tasted a buckwheat honey that made me – want to, uh, you know, take it outside and dump it down the sewer heading one into my house. <laughs> what about alfalfa honey? Uh, alfalfa honey I, I've used, actually. It makes a very interesting meat. It's, it's, it's got body to it. It's got a floral, a very unique floral characteristics. And, in fact, I've got a traditional mead with me right now that's made from alfalfa honey. It's very tasty. So if you mix the uh, buckwheat honey and the alfalfa honey... You could have an hour, an hour gang, honey. You could, <laughs> you could have an hour. Alfalfa and buckwheat, great. <laughs> oh, I should have seen that one coming. <laughs> you could have an, have an hour gang mead. Hour gang mead. <laughs> there you go. Gotta love it. You could give it to Darla. <laughs> 
Oh, mercy. Oh. Too funny. So water. What do you got to water. What do you okay. got to think of uh, when you when you think about your water for your means? Two things to, about the water. One, again, it, it, like most brews, if you've got highly chlorinated water, filter it or let it sit overnight to get the, chlorate, the chlorine out of it. Uh, the other side of the coin is don't use distilled water. I've seen that um, put out several times. The yeast need minerals, and there are no minerals in honey, really. That's why we're adding nutrient. So just use spring water or use your tap water. I tend to get uh, you know spring water from the store, again, because I'm lazy and I don't want to filter. Um, and it's easier to cart around, especially in my house when I'm going downstairs and you know, uh, it's just it's easier to, to cart around and to measure out and those kind of things when you have bottled water. So standard water rules apply. Typically, you don't have to adjust for salting or anything like that, so no gypsum or any of that kind of stuff is necessary. Just regular old spring water works great. Hmm. And you mentioned nutrients. What kinds of nutrients are we, we talking about, and why do we want to use them? So the reason why you use nutrients is because honey has no nutrients in it. Uh, it's just sugar, really. And without those nutrients, the yeast have nothing to keep them healthy, and you will get what you experience uh, in some of the older books. People will say that, you know, meat takes a long time to ferment. Well, it's because it has no nutrients in it. And what you're going to find is that if you try to do it without nutrients, you're going to get some funky off flavors to start with just because the yeast are having to work so hard. Hmm. They're they're, they're, uh, metabolizing all the sugar, but they don't really – they're not healthy when they're doing it. So you have to let it uh, ferment out really long time. Then you have to let it age for a long time to get those off flavors out, which is why it, uh, mead has this reputation for taking so long to ferment and to age. If you properly nutrient your mead, your must, and uh, manage your fermentation with, uh, with the proper nutrients, uh, most of my meads finish mer- fermentation in under two weeks. Wow. And uh, the really the the only thing that really determines how long I have to let them age is how alcoholic they are. If they're nine percent or lower, they're drinkable in three months. If they're more than that, it can take up to a year to really get the alcohol fully out of the out of the uh, taste. But uh, the fermentation goes really quick. Um, I use a wine nutrient uh, called Fermaid K. It's uh, commonly available for in most local homebrew stores. They should be able to get it. I used to use one called Superfood, but Superfood is only available in very large quantities, and I wasn't using those large quantities, so I switched to Fermade K, which is basically the same. The other thing that uh, I use is diammonium phosphate, otherwise known as DAP. You'll see it called DAP, D-A-P. That uh, adds additional nitrogen into the mix. Uh, again, the uh, Fermade K was really meant for, for wine, but uh, mead has the need for additional nutrients. And you'll see on some yeasts, they'll say, you know, it has a high nutrient need or it has a low nutrient need. Then you can adjust the DAP addition according to what uh, yeast you're using. But So yeast nutrient and DAP and uh, add it in to the must. There's uh, different nutrient addition schedules, which we'll get into in, during the process discussion. But uh, you definitely have to have those to have a nice, clean, and uh, rapid fermentation. So you talked about pH before. Uh, I assume that there are ingredients that you can use to adjust your pH if the pH goes wacky. Yes. Uh, So what you'll see is that your acidity will rise. So your pH will fall uh, in the early stages of your fermentation. Uh, I've had a mead to go down below 3.0 pH in the first 24 hours. It was very, very rapid. Hmm. And what you need to do is adjust that back up. So uh, I recommend potassium bicarbonate or calcium carbonate, whichever one your homebrew store carries. Calcium carbonate will adjust it up a lot quicker per gram than bicarbonate. So uh, either one works. So just be aware that the carbonate is a little bit more uh, potent, the bicarbonate. Uh, I will typically add five grams, uh, per, you know, five-gallon batch, so it's a gram per gallon, uh, just to adjust the pH up on a typical batch. Hmm. Uh, it's very, very important on traditional meads. If you're doing a blended uh, batch like a braggot, braggot really it, it doesn't ne- necessarily need the adjustment, but pure traditional mead musts will typically need a pH adjustment. So uh, potassium carbonate or potassium bicarbonate, I don't recommend calcium carbonate just because it tends to add a chalky flavor to the must, and, and it doesn't dissolve nearly as well as uh, potassium carbonate. 
So when you get lower in the pH, you get more acidic, right? You get more acidic, and then, again, the yeast needs to work harder, which slows down the fermentation and also contributes to off flavors because the yeast are in a very acidic environment. Yep. And just like in wine, sometimes you use uh, stabilizing agents, right? Stabilizing, stabilizing agents, especially if you are going to be shipping bottles or moving bottles around, this is just to ensure that the fermentation is done because especially if your mead comes out sweet, um, that yeast, if, if it's really hearty, can stick around and ferment even after it looks like all activity has gone out. So you can stabilize with um, uh, is it potassium metabosulfate and potassium sorbate just to, uh, uh, to ensure that the yeast are dead, let it sit for a week or so, and then rack off of it, um, just like wine. Uh, again, that's up to personal preference. I know some people that never use additives like that. If I'm if I'm shipping bottles, I will definitely, or if I'm moving bottles around or carting them around somewhere, I will definitely uh, stabilize that so I don't have bottle bombs in the bottle in the in the car or bottle bombs in the packaging or whatnot. Hmm. But uh, you can you can do that perfectly acceptable. Just uh, follow the recommended dosages. And uh, acid blend is also used in winemaking as well. Yes, acid blend is one of those things that tends to uh, be misunderstood when you see it in an ingredient list on the web. Acid blend will, should only be used at the end of the fermentation to adjust for flavor. As we said before, when you ferment, the pH will go down and get too acidic, and you're going to um, contribute to that if you add that acid blend at the beginning of fermentation. You're just going to make the matters worse. Typically, most wines don't, or most meats don't need an adjustment. You just you know, let it ferment out, taste it, it tastes great, leave it alone. Typically, acid blend is only added when it's too sweet, when, when the uh, meat is cloyingly sweet. You add a little acid blend in there to taste just to, to take the edge off that cloyingly sweetness. I've done that to one mead, I think, my entire my entire career so far. <laughs> uh, and that was with a uh, agave nectar mead uh, or wine, as you know, technically. And it came out way too sweet, so I added some acid blend, and it made it taste really, really good. Now, finally, uh, I've used fining agents in uh, one batch of mead in my <laughs> in my short but active uh, uh, mead making career, um, and I wasn't satisfied because uh, this uh, and it might have been a gelatin, uh, which resulted in this layer of sediment in the bottom of the of the mead. You know, it cleared the mead out, but then it uh, had this layer in the bottom that I couldn't. I didn't want to drink, you know, I didn't want to siphon out. So uh, all the rest of the meads that I've done through time have just been naturally settled, you know, they've been just naturally clarified, and I haven't used finding agents. How do you stand on finding agents? I use finding agents only when absolutely necessary. Um, I know one honey in particular that I get up here in Colorado is the Colorado alfalfa honey just doesn't seem to want to clear on its own. Um, my my first batch that I realized this on after three months hadn't cleared, I used a product called Sparkaloid, and it's the hot mixed type of Sparkaloid. Cleared it out really, really quick, very, very clear. Downside is you do get this buildup at the bottom, and Sparkaloid in particular has a very, very fine particulate matter. So you have to let it sit for four to eight weeks. Mm. They say week minimum, recommend eight weeks just to let it compact enough so that when you uh, rack it out of the carboy, that it doesn't stir up again. The next batch that I made, I used a product called Bentonite. Mm -hmm. uh, Bentonite is an inert clay. Um, there's a raging debate on whether you should add it before fermentation or after fermentation. Most wine kits that you get, especially like the Wine Expert wine kits, We'll have the bentonite added in before, mm -hmm. and I've made some great wines with the wine expert kits, so I don't think that it, it, there's, it's that detrimental. And I did an experiment where I did a gallon batch of two gallon batch, one gallon batches of alfalfa mead, and one I added the proper amount of bentonite at the beginning. The other one I left alone, and at the end of the two weeks, the uh, bentonite batch was completely clear. Huh. It just cleared on its own. The other batch uh, ne uh, never cleared. Hmm. So uh, it works great. But, again, experiment with the honeys. Do one-gallon batches. See which honeys need clarifying and which ones don't. If you can do it without it, great. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a hands-off kind of guy. I don't like to add things unless I absolutely have to. But if, if you want a clear mead, 
and uh, that honey is not going to clear on its own, you're going to have to make your peace with a finding agent. Or buy a wine filter, hmm. which is a, an expensive proposition, but if you've got the funds and you don't want to use finding agents, you know, have at it. There's uh, one other thing that I've r- discovered in recent years, and it's something which is called a rehydration nutrient. It's another product uh, from uh, it's, it's from one of the yeast makers. I think it's from uh, so it's not it's not from White Labs. It may be from Y Yeast. It's called GoFirm, and GoFirm is a micronutrient that you add to the rehydration water. Um, if you get really scientifically te- uh, techy, like some homebrewers like to get. If you put your yeast into clean water, the process of osmosis is going to pull some of the nutrients out of the yeast as it rehydrates through the cell wall. The idea of the rehydration uh, nutrient is to put those nutrients into the water so that when they rehydrate, the osmosis actually pulls those nutrients in into the yeast instead. So you get a healthier batch of yeast when you get ready to pitch. So that's go firm. Go from G O dash F E R M. Oh, uh, F E R. Okay, I, right. I get the uh, email for another product called Go Firm, but it's spelled differently. So, uh, <laughs> the- yeah, I think those end up in my spam filter. I think. <laughs> yeah, wrong product. It's, it's I very important. I got a million of them. I get- <laughs> yeah, the uh, I have a million of the spam too. Um, <laughs> It's very, very important to to note that you should never use regular yeast nutrient in your rehydration water. Ah. The formula is absolutely wrong for that, and it will be detrimental to the yeast. Go firm for rehydration, and then once you pitch, regular nutrients in the must. Okay, well let's let's get on to the let's get on to the process. Now we got our stuff, we got our gear, we got our ingredients, and now we're all ready to go. Um, Indeed. The the first question is. Do you pasteurize or do you not pasteurize? I mean, that's, that, that seems to be one of the main debates in, in mead making, is it not? Oh, absolutely it is. And uh, I have seen more than enough YouTube videos where the guy is sitting there on his, on his stove boiling his, his honey Ooh. water mixture and skimming the stuff off the top. Ooh. Um, my opinion is, is that that is completely unnecessary. That scum is going to settle out with the yeast after fermentation and uh, the, it's going to be detrimental to, to boil your honey because you're going to drive off all the aromatics and, so, and a lot, some of the flavor. And uh, that just makes me cringe personally. I am an advocate of the cold mix method. You put in your water, you put in your honey, and you mix. And it's a great play for the gas whip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it makes that so much easier because I don't know if you've ever tried to, to manually mix cold water or room temperature water and honey. Yeah, it's not not a fun proposition, but the gas whip is going to help that tremendously. <laughs> like I said, it's one of the best things from from my method that I bought uh, ever. It's great. Um, now the key to sanitation when you're not pasteurizing is to pitch yeast as quickly after you mix as possible. When honey is in its regular state before you mix it, it's hydroscopic and it's not prone to spoilage. That changes the moment you mix it in with water. You've diluted the, the sugar into water solution. Now it's primed for, for nasties, and uh, you need to get your yeast in as quickly as possible. Standard sanitation rules apply. Anything that's going to touch that uh, must needs to be sanitized. Um, now, the way that I do my small batches is, is that I have a gallon glass jar that I had some honey come in one time, and I sanitize that. I put that on my scale, and I measure out whatever... Uh, the amount of honey is. For my one-gallon batches, I usually uh, I call it a one-gallon batch, but it usually comes out to 0.8 of a gallon for mix. Two and a half pounds of honey. So I will pour the two and a half gallons of honey into that glass jar on a scale to measure it out. I will then put in half the water that I need, shake it up real good, and then, and then put it into the fermenter, and then I'll pour the other half into that jar, shake it out to get the rest of the honey, and then pour it into the fermenter. So that's how I do my cold mix uh, for my one-gallon batches. For my five-gallon batches, it's a little harder. Um, I do the ba- same basic method, uh, but I you know, measure the honey out as best I can in the one-gallon jar, pour some of the water in, shake it up to get all the honey out, put the rest of the water in- in- into the fermenter. At that point, it's somewhat mixed, but not really. Go after it with a gas whip to uh, mix it up. 
take a, a, uh, a hydrometer reading or a refractometer reading and then add water as needed to get to the, uh, to the gravity that I'm trying to get to. But it, definitely a cold mix. And at that point, you do your, uh, your fermentation nutrient uh, at that time? Right. So the next thing you're going to put in is, depending on if, you're going to, if you know that you need to fine your honey early, you put in your fining agents, mix it up again, gas whip. You're going to continue to use that thing uh, for a long time. So uh, gas whip to add in the fining agent. Uh, the next bit is, um, as you said, the nutrients. Now, it's not recommended that you dump in all the nutrients right at first. Okay, The idea is to do what's called a staggered nutrient addition. So what the, I use as a process is that I'll put in about, let's see, about 45% of the nutrient at yeast pitch. Okay, Once the uh, fermentation drops the uh, gravity by a couple of degrees, so a couple of points, two or three points, I'll add in the next 35%. And then right before it hits half the halfway point, down to where my final gravity wanted to be, I'll add in the remaining 25%. This is why you have to take regular gravity readings because if you don't, you're going to miss an you're going to miss an addition. Now, why do you stagger the nutrient additions? Uh, if you do too much up, up front, the yeast are going to be nice and healthy. They're going to be really really hungry, and then they're going to run out of nutrient, and then they'll go back to being tired, and then they still have a lot of yeast, a lot of honey to do. Hmm. Uh, to, to, to eat through. So you add it in stages to make sure that they don't overgrow or uh, get too strong and then wear themselves out. Hmm. So you add it in the stages. Uh, some pe- Different people have different ways of adding in stages. You want to get all of your nutrient in before the halfway point. And according to certain um, yeast experts, you want to get 75% of it in before the, thir- the one-third uh, point. So... There's a lot of materials on the web you can read about this. I have I have this method that I use. It makes it very simple, as simple as it can be. But you have to take regular readings, and that's why, it's, uh, for, especially for small batches, I use a refractometer instead of a regular hydrometer. And just like high-gravity beer fermentations, proper aeration is key. Yes, yeah, so you, ha- you need to get a good body of yeast to ferment. Aeration is crucial. And, in fact, it's okay to add additional oxygen within the first 36 hours of fermentation. So what I'll do is that uh, I'll push my yeast sometime in the late afternoon, early evening. I'll put in a minute of oxygen for a five-gallon batch. And then the next morning, once fermentation has started, I will do another 30 seconds to a minute, just depending on how high the gravity is at that point. I'll add Mm -hmm. additional oxygen in. Of course, once you get past that point, it's not a good idea. But within the first 36 hours, according to most of the uh, wine and mead yeast experts, you can do uh, an additional oxygen uh, addition uh, if you wish. And I do I do two additions, one at the beginning and one uh, at about eight hours or next morning. But, uh, yes, aeration is very, very crucial. Now, you don't have to – we didn't talk in depth about the, the yeast that you used, did we? Uh, no, we didn't. You, you, you can use uh, yeast that specifically – uh, sold, branded as mead yeasts, but you can also use wine yeasts, and we discovered as well that you can use beer yeasts too. You can use pretty much any yeast that you like. And going back to uh, David Myers, I always get David <laughs> Myers in mind when I say that. The key is that you need a yeast that can tolerate high gravity, and you want a yeast that's going to give you the results that you want. Um, I typically stick with white wine yeasts. I have used red wine yeast and piments. I've used red wine yeasts, you know, for experiments and whatnot. And as we said, we have I have used beer yeasts. I've got an experiment right now with a, which I'm using a 1056 American Ale for various types of honeys. Uh, as a result of my beer yeast experiment, that's the one that everybody likes best. So now I'm doing a honey, a honey flavor experiment with that yeast. Uh, I've seen American Ale yeast used for... Um, uh, what do you call those things? Yes, um, high gravity beers. What oh, are they the called barley wines. Barley wines. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, we know that they can tolerate high gravities. We know from the experiment that the 1056 can tolerate high gravities. So uh, I use that, and sure enough, it's working great. 
I'm very anxious to see how that comes out, how the taste comes out. But again, a proper preparation of your yeast is crucial because you are putting that yeast into a, a, a typically into a high gravity must. If you're using liquid yeasts, be sure you prepare them as per the uh, instructions with the Y yeast smack packs. Be sure to smack them and let them rise for three to six hours. With uh, dry yeast, you do want to you know unless you're pitching at a horribly large amount of yeast, you do want to rehydrate them. You know you can use the rehydration agents to give you a, uh, a heads up on that. Um, you can make a starter. But if you're going to make a starter, you want to use something that has some nutrient in it. You can use, uh, you know, a light malt extract. Some people even use uh, apple cider. Hmm. But you do, you do want to decant that off, you know, as much as you can before you add it into your must because you don't want it to, uh, you know, overly flavor your final product. Right. Now, when your when your fermentation kicks off, you said that the pH drops rather rapidly. How do you keep an eye on that? And how do you adjust it? Uh, for the first 48 to 72 hours, I will take a pH reading twice a day. Wow. And uh, once that pH reading starts to get to below 3.5 uh, to 3.2, um, I will add in the stuff to bring it back up. And then after 72 hours, it'll it's pretty much stabilized, so you don't have to worry about it past that point. But I take you have to take regular pH readings. There's really no other way to do it. Now, when you put it in, do you use the gas whip again, or do you just uh, is the fermentation active enough to where it mixes in the the ingredients there? I take a very very small sample, just enough to where I can get the tip of the pH meter submerged, and then I submerge the pH uh, meter into it to take a reading, and then I toss that little sample out. But then, when you when you add the uh, the adjustment, oh, uh, when you're adding the, right when you're adding the uh, the pH adjustment, the uh, potassium carbonate. Um, it's very important to add it carefully. You don't just put it in and then hit it with the gas whip, because what will happen is is that the, the uh, it's typically in a powder form, potassium carbonate, potassium bicarbonate, and if you just pitch it in and do that, the CO2 in the must is going to attach to that uh, powder, uh, and it becomes a nucleation site, and mm. it's going to spew like the uh, Mentos uh, Diet Coke things you see on YouTube. Not as fun. <laughs> so what you'll want to do is uh, pull a, you know, sanitize the wine thief or something, pull a small sample, put the uh, the nutrient addition or you know this works for nutrient addition and also for pH adjustment nutrient, mix it in and in the liquid there and then pour it back in, and then uh, go at it lightly with your with your whip. You don't mm -hmm. have to really beat it really hard. You just need enough to get it mixed in. Mm -hmm. And is that it? I mean, you just uh, once you get the the pH stabilized in that first critical phase, does it take care of itself? Can you just uh, let nature take its course at that point? Yeah, for the first uh, seventy two hours, you're watching pH, you're watching the gravity for your second nutrient addition, um, you're watching the fermentation to make sure everything's great, um, you're watching the temperature. The temperature uh, should be relatively high compared to a beer. Mead loves higher temperatures. It likes to be 70, 72. Uh, with certain yeast, you are going to get some off flavors. You will get a banana and clove off of a Hefeweizen yeast, for example. Um, some of those uh, off flavors are desirable. Mm -hmm. Some of them may not be, depending on what you're trying to do. If you lower the temperature, the fermentation is going to take longer. Uh, wine yeasts are like ale yeast. They like higher temperatures um, to ferment. So you're watching the temperatures to make sure that they're staying in range. Um, and then, uh, you know, after 72 hours, your pH is, is stabilized. Then you're watching for the halfway point for the gravity to make your final nutrient addition. Once that nutrient addition is done, you just let it sit. Um, at that point, uh, you're waiting in the next week or two for the fermentation to end. You're watching it to, to see if it clears. Once it clears, you can I would recommend one racking. And letting it sit for another few weeks just to see to make sure everything is falling out, um, and then at that point you can uh, stabilize if you want, uh, add in the uh, stabilizing agents and whatnot, and then whip it with a wine whip if you want to to get all the CO two out. That is going to settle out some additional yeast that you didn't know was there. Let it sit out for a few weeks until you're comfortable. Rack it off, and then you can bottle it, or you can let it sit in bulk age. Hmm. It's really up to you. 
I, you know, some people insist on bulk aging their mead for a year. Some people don't want to need the carboys for other stuff, like me, and I'll bottle so that I can clear out the carboys and use it for other stuff. It's really personal preference. So, I mean, those those sound like fairly basic and easy to follow uh, rules to to uh, to to heed in in making meads. What uh, what do you think are the rookie mistakes that uh, that people most often make, or what what do you think is uh, stands most in the way of making a good mead? So beyond the the, the pure ignorance of not knowing that you have to manage uh, the fermentation with nutrients and not having to do a pH, you know, watching your pH. Uh, the one thing that that I see a lot on the internet that is a big mistake is that they go into making meat assuming it's going to be like beer. Hmm. Okay, uh, Almost every beginning beer recipe you have or those you know, beer recipes on the, on the web will have you know, gypsum and Irish moss and all this other stuff that you add in. That stuff is completely unnecessary in meat making. There's not a lot of protein to clear out in meat and since you're not boiling it, I mean, the Irish moss is practically useless. Uh, the salting is an adjustment of the water. Again, not necessary in meat making. And the too many people will do that recipe, and then it tastes terrible at the end of going, this meat stuff, meat is yucky, and they'll throw it out. And they have this impression that that's what meat is supposed to taste like. And that's unfortunate. Uh, if you're drinking a mead, what you should be drinking, especially if it's a traditional, in my opinion, you should be tasting an alcoholic beverage that tastes like honey. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any funkiness in it at all. Um, and I think that uh, too many people go to the web, end up at the wrong spot, and end up with some archaic recipe that someone came up with trying to do some ancient mead recipe from a book that they found buried underneath the tomb of, you know, uh, <laughs> jet in, in in Egypt <laughs> instead of just trying to keep it very basic. Um, you know, some of the best commercial mead, you go in and, what's in this? And it's like, well, it's honey, water, yeast, and nutrient. And like, that's it? Yeah, that's it. It's the process that's the important. You know, the extra ingredients that really should, should be should wait until after you've got more experience managing the fermentation under your belt, then go into uh, more exotic meads. Now, what are your favorite resources for those who want to learn more uh, in detail and study mead making? What are, what are the resources that you're most accustomed to uh, going to when you're looking for knowledge? Find a good forum. Now, the forum that I use most often is the Got Mead forums at gotmead.com. Um, there is another site which uh, is the site of a gentleman who really turned me on to all the all the uh, necessary things that you need to do in mead making. His name uh, online is his name is High Test, and if you go to my blog, my and I have to plug my blog. My blog is www.mythicmountain.com. That's m y t h i c mountain.com. There's a link on the left side that says High Tests Honey Haven. If you click that link, at the bottom of this page, there are some PDFs of all of, of all of his FAQs. And the FAQs are there for basic mead fermentation, for potassium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate, um, for the fining agents, uh, for the pH, you know, the proper care of a pH meter. All of those things are at the bottom of the page. I spend most of my research time at Got Mead and at the High Test Honey Haven. The one thing you will want to get from the High Test Honey Haven at the bottom right is the Mead Calculator Spreadsheet. It is in Excel format, and it, it will let you uh, estimate based on you know how many pounds of honey and how much water what your original gravity should be. And it does have that refractometer uh, calculation in it so that when you're in fermentation, It'll say, you know, here's your original gravity based on the honey calculation. If your refractometer is reading this bricks, this is the adjusted original gravity that, that the meat is actually is at. So it has that in the calculator. That I use that calculator for every batch that I do. Wow. Well, very, very useful stuff. And very, uh, you know, it's... I, I, of course, I, I barely have time to brew beer uh, nowadays, much less, <laughs> much less yeah. uh, experiment with meads. But uh, you know, you've got me curious to to go back in there again and and try some of the things that you've uh, that you've suggested and and see you know see if I can improve my meads. When it comes to brewing mead, it's the exact opposite of beer. With beer, it seems like all the hard work is before you pitch yeast. 
Mm-hmm. With mead, all the hard work is right after you pitch yeast. Yeah, the, the fermentation process has to be managed. Well, excellent. I'll put a link to your to your blog in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. And excellent. it's been fun. I appreciate your time again, Mike. It's my pleasure, and uh, I'm just glad I could contribute to the homebrewing hobby of mead. Well, thanks again to Mike. I'll post a link to his blog, mythicmountain.com, where you can read more about Mike's mead making and beer making adventures. Don't forget to tune into the ustream.tv slash basic brewing, U S T R E A M dot TV slash basic brewing on Monday, May 26th at 8 p.m. Central Time, hopefully for a live video stream if we can get our act together. I think we will. Uh, until then, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say hey, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our low-tech lagering and decoction mashing DVD on basicbrewingshop.com where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash and you can follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer where I don't use a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs and Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step step, from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing Stepping into All Grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We've got uh, combo deals to save you a few bucks if you buy more than one DVD at a time. And you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, order it from us online, and I'll send it out myself. Yeah, you can find our shop again at basicbrewingshop.com. Our hats and shirts are out there, including our ever-popular Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. And boy, we've had a flurry of uh, people buying apparel. I guess everybody's stocking up for summertime. hope that you can take some cool pictures of yourself out with your, your gear on, your basic brewing gear, uh, in cool places, doing cool beer things. And I'll post them on the, uh, send them to me, I'll post them on the gallery page. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Weed Eater, a 16-inch, 31cc, gas-powered, dual-cut, wheel trimmer, number WT3100. And, if I could only remember my name, David Crosby. It's good he remembered long enough to put it on the album. It's handy. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate the support there. And there's also a Kindle link there if you decide you want to buy one of those. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by our buddy Kelly Dodson down in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Thank you.